Hi, this video was inspired from a tweet that I got and it was from um, someone by the awesome name of Johnny Cash. I love us. Uh, Ferris tweets now. Fantastic. Absolutely. That, that's a winning name. I love it. Johnny Cash. None of this cash rubbish. It's Cash. Anyway, and uh, there's Ben. Hi, Ben. He's in on the action too. And uh, basically the question uh, started out being, I've seen a lot of four 8-bit digital computer projects using TTL Logic. Um, from limited FPGA experience, I know that meeting timing is critical for a function in design. Yet on these simple projects, nobody seems to talk about this. And talks about uh, signal propagation delay through the wires is much faster than through digital logic. Can design like this be routed uh, that these constraints with Without the constraints being violated what frequency is this relevant and he talks about uh, that what could be problematic like routing a clock signal too far away uh, from registers and other things where they have to go through other gates and take other paths on the PCB and it, it gets complicated at what point does it become an issue and he'd like someone to clarify this and uh, Ben asks what's the question I guess the question is for simple slow 4 8 bit computers for example the Gigatron uh, is propagation delay for digital signals an issue in the design layout of the board and at what clock frequency roughly would this become a big issue well <laughs> this opens a rather big can of worms it's in some respects, fairly easy to clarify. In other respects, well, no, we have to chase a red herring down a rabbit hole yet again. But it's something a lot of people have asked me about over the years, and that is, what point do I have to start doing these serpentine traces in a design, for example, to match the uh, length of the traces going to memory and and stuff like that. I like why and at what point and at what frequency do you do this? Well, I I kind of replied this in my uh, tweet here. It only becomes an issue really at sort of like DDR level speeds. Like, you know, when you start talking 100 megahertz, couple hundred megahertz clock rates and stuff like that, but not necessarily, but in generally for high speed design like this, because most people are not gonna design their own, you know, a TTL computer like this. But uh, FPGA stuff, for example, has timing requirements and there are specific timing analysis tools that you can use inside FPGAs, but that's a whole nother, you can do a year's worth of a series of videos on uh, just that issue but it basically on a DDR or double data rate memory which if you don't know a DDR stands for double data rate and that's when uh, data is actually clocked on both the positive and the negative edge so twice per clock cycle and the first thing I mentioned in my tweet is the traditional rule of thumb, which you must know when you're designing electronics, laying out boards and stuff like that, is the signal propagation through a trace on a PCB is approximately one nanosecond of propagation delay for every 15 centimeters or six inches for you Yanks of uh, PCB trace. So you've got a, a trace which goes from here over to here and it's 15 centimeters long it takes one nanosecond for that signal to travel across your board like that so if you've got your cpu over here and your memory over here like 15 centimeters away for example then it's a one nanosecond propagation bleh, propagation delay from your cpu to your chip but more importantly and the difference with serpentine traces and trace length matching which is what this video is really going to be about and why you sometimes have to at what point you really think about having to do this sort of thing is that um often you can't route all your traces across ideally you should you should prioritize when you're routing out pcbs you should prioritize high speed memory buses and things like that but let's just say for the extreme example i put in twitter here is that if you had one of your signals for example one of your data pins take an extra 15 centimeter path to all your other data pins so that's a real extreme example of a really bad constrained pcb layout but even then there'd only be a one nanosecond difference so if you look at a 100 megahertz uh, ddr memory which clocks on both cycles so you've got 10 nanoseconds for one cycle but because it clocks on both the positive and negative edge it's half that or every five nanoseconds you've got a one nanosecond delay in there for your five nanosecond uh you know uh, uh, clocking intervals 
for your data. So that really it starts to become a very significant issue uh, at that point. But that's for 100 megahertz, but that's for extreme case of 15 centimeters difference between your best case signal and your worst case signal. But it gets crazy complicated with a design like the Gigatron, which is a TTL computer like this, because, well, okay, there's memory here, and there's memory over here, but all these registers and everything else in the actual processor, it's all over the shop. And really, when you're laying out something like this, you wouldn't put any thought into really the layout of this and optimizing it for speed. You may, if you're going after the absolute best possible speed you could for something like this, but generally you wouldn't bother. You just end up with what you end up with. So when you finish your design, your layout, you build it up and it works. The thing with these sort of computers is you just want them to work, right? You don't care whether it uh, works at, you know, nine megahertz or 10 megahertz, for example, not really that important. It's going to work at several megs, for example. I think the Gigatron, I think I've tested it up to about eight megahertz and it works over that. Uh, you have to change the chips from 74HC on here. I believe uh, the designers of the Gigatron have used 74F series chips or fast TTL chips, um, which reduces the propagation delay through the actual chip itself uh, compared to the HC chips. And I think they've gotten up to, don't quote me, it's like, you know, 15 megs or something like that. But really like nobody cares in theory it is possible to actually simulate this and work out you know the worst possible pro propagation delay and at what point it would fail in your architecture of your processor and stuff like that but oh god you wouldn't bother really that's just no 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 but it really becomes a big deal on a complex design, like uh, something like this. This is a 12 layer open source hardware. I'll link it in uh, down below. It's um, some Argentinian thing. Fantastic. Anyway, it's a Xilinx Kintex 7 FPGA with two ARM Cortex A9 processors in it. It's got one gig of DDR3 memory. And if you have a look at here, it's a 12 layer board. It's got the, it's got big ass uh, processor on here. Here's your DDR memory. Here's your expansion. And look, look at all of these serpentine traces. They do this to match the trace length. So there's no uh, skew or difference between one data pin and another data pin or a clock pin and a, or another clock pin or something like that. They even them out, not only to memory, but also to uh, this expansion, um, like header up here as well. So, you know, it and not only between signals, but also between individual pairs. We'll get into that as well. But as I said in my tweet, uh, DDR3, uh, well, DDR level memory is sort of, once you start getting into the hundreds of megahertz, this is where it really starts to matter. So anyway, I thought we'd just uh, do a, a little dive into some data sheets and stuff like that and just find out exactly why do you have to do this and at what speed does it matter? Well, let's go into it. But unfortunately, there's some one thing I'm going to leave out of this video, and I have to, that will be signal integrity. Because uh, you'll notice that the, these, these traces down here, these are thick traces. They are thicker than your other signal, layers go, uh, signal lines going around here like this. This means that they're uh, obviously doing like a controlled impedance trace, because there's a big ground plane underneath here. So you can see see that there. So signal integrity is another thing entirely, even on this, which I've done a video on, like uh, removing bypass capacitors months in on a board like this. Does it have an effect? Well, on, on something like this, uh, yeah, DDR level memory on your computers that you're familiar with, um, yeah, it's a big deal. Signal termination, signal integrity, stuff like that. You'll see termination resistors. There's different techniques uh, for termination and stuff like, oh yeah, have they got termination resistors at the end here? Um, I, don't, I haven't looked into this design. But anyway, that also factors into the equation equation of not just propagation delay of signals, but signal integrity as well, because then you can get reflections and I like, and <laughs> truly, if you want to analyze this sort of stuff properly, you're going to take signal integrity into account as well. But today, we're only going to look at signal propagation delay times and setup and hold times and all that sort of jazz. Let's get into it. 
So this propagation delay rule of thumb, which I've been talking about, it comes about because a propagation delay on a signal on a bit of copper on a PCB is different than it is through a wire or free air because of the dielectric constant of the PCB material. What are the fiberglass that it's actually made up with? And you've maybe heard dielectric uh, constant before. A typical FR4 PCB might be four or four and a half dielectric constant. And there's formulas, I'll link in this down below, this is from uh, just Sierra circuits and there's formulas where you can calculate this sort of stuff and you can even go deeper down into the material science of it and things like that but basically ER is the dielectric uh, material of constant of the material but it basically comes down to here it is uh, six inches per nanosecond for a typical thing that's what it is but it varies between PCBs because the materials vary a lot your standard FR4 can vary quite significantly in in its dielectric uh, constant and there's better materials for example Rogers Corporation make very expensive very schmick PCB materials for RF applications and other controlled impedance applications if you're doing a, a really high-end DDR4 memory board or something like that where the data rates are phenomenal uh, you know high-speed FPGA and all sorts of you know memory interconnects and architecture and stuff like that well you might be using a more controlled impedance PCB because something like this look you can choose your dielectric constant from 3 to 10 knock yourself out look at this this one down here it's ptf ceramic dielectric constant 3 plus minus 0.04 thank you very much real expensive exotic materials you can really do your controlled impedance traces but you know for most designers uh just a regular fr4 and just knowing roughly what the uh dielectric constant is and using a rule of thumb good enough and if we go into a PCB calculator like this satin one, which I highly recommend, it's the best out there, then we can have a look for a typical uh, trace on top of your PCB like this. Typical propagation delay, they have it for picoseconds in centimeters, and you enter your ER up here, your dielectric constant, average, you know, like a typical 4.5, for example, and you solve, and it's basically 57.6 picoseconds per centimeter propagation delay. And if you change that to 4, and it's changing from 57 to 54 even if you go down to extreme three or something like that you know it's not varying by a huge amount so if your designs are that critical on your propagation delay to actually work then either you're working on some bleeding edge system at daylight speeds or you're just you're doing it wrong you're <laughs> you're being too critical on your design uh constraints you're not being loosey-goosey enough yeah you could come a gutter um and really you shouldn't on something like this you should be operating with re reasonably good design margins where using a rule of thumb is more than enough and you'll notice of course this doesn't change with frequency there's 500 megahertz let's drop down to 100 Oh, that doesn't change any, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't, because it makes absolutely, the frequency doesn't matter. It's the just the propagation delay, the signal. And of course, that can change with how your signal's routed on your PCB. As I said, this one is on the top layer with your ground plane underneath like this. Well, that's a micro strip, of course. And I've, I've actually tweaked my dielectric constantly. Give a spot on, almost spot on, uh, 50 ohms, uh, 50 ohms. <laughs> I'm thinking impedance up here. <laughs> no, um, 50 picoseconds per centimeter here. Um, so let's actually change that to microstrip embedded. Oh, we're gone up to 55 because it's embedded inside your dielectric material. That's the green part there. And and strip line like that, 59. So look, it's you know, it, it's gone up fairly significantly. That's 20% difference right there in your propagation delay, just because you put your signal in there. So if you've got your 12 layer board like this one here, good luck trying to, you can get simulators for this sort of stuff. You know, you can do it field solvers and like real expensive uh, software to do it. But look, look at all these, look at all these serpentine squiggly traces in here. So yeah, trying to figure out like exact <laughs> propagation delays of all this sort of stuff. That's why you should be designing with like a rule of thumb with margins kind of thing. Like it's it's just, yeah, to try and analyze this. You might have to, as I said, bleeding edge uh, stuff. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Okay, knock yourself out. But um, generally, yeah, you shouldn't 
have to, but be aware that matters. Even the weave of the PCB dielectric material, you'll notice like if you have a look at the construction of it, it's weaved like this, you know, it's a woven pattern. And if you run your signal uh, actually on top of one of the weaves and or then uh, like in the direction that it's going, you get a different dielectric constant than if you do if it's passing over the ones running in the other direction like that. That can matter as well. That can change your propagation delay right there and your signal integrity and everything else. So let's take a look at a, a discrete design like this Gigatron. It uses the absolute classic 62256 SRAM, which has been around from day dot, 32K SRAM chip, and it's available in fast access times from uh, 45 up to 85 nanoseconds. So let's take the fastest 45 nanoseconds right off the bat there. You've got the fastest design you could possibly get uh, for your computer using this. Um, and nothing else considered is about 22.2 megahertz. Um, that's as fast as you can access the memory on this thing you can't cycle it any quicker than that so right off the bat you know your rule of thumb that 15 centimeters per one nanosecond so right off the bat if you please excuse the crudity of model didn't have time to build the scale or to paint it um let's say this is your 62256 chip here this is the physical layout of board let's say this is your processor chip over here i know the address lines don't match up you don't actually have to match up the address lines by the way little routing trick there you can actually depends on the design you can actually it doesn't matter where in this memory you actually store something depends on the design but you can actually swap data and address lines because it's just a random array of it it's just an array of it's just a memory array in there do you care that it stores it in this part of the thing no no you've got, you know, you've got some routing constraints like this now, this is what i was talking about before about prioritizing your layout if you knew that memory speed was important you wouldn't whack memory on the other side of the processor over here memory over here for example and then one corner and then you've got to cross the board and you've got to go all wiggledy piggledy with your traces and everything else you wouldn't do it anyway but look this trace here is just by natural layout is going to be half the length less than half the length of the one on the outside here that could be 30 centimeters let's say it's extreme like that right that's only two nanoseconds out of our 45 nanoseconds whoop-de-doo it's not just the layout of the board is not going to affect a design like this not a chance that's why uh, computer designers in the 80s really didn't have to take this into account in the general sense they they might have for various uh, like like niche parts of the design but overall in the basic scheme of things no you just didn't care but of course this is where you get up to uh your setup and hold times and you can get into our way yeah there's our yeah there's our read timing waveforms brilliant if you're doing serious design maybe if you want me to do a video on how to read these kinds of uh timing diagrams and things like that please please let me know because that's an interesting thing how do you what does all the what do these things mean what is it what is all this i don't get it you know anyway um uh, propagation delay like for example the address or the data might have to be on the pins a certain amount of time before the clock pulse comes along and that's called your setup time your data or your address your input data to your chip has to be set up before that clock edge um it comes along but in this particular case uh aha uh -huh, of course there's nothing in the read cycle for the setup but if we go into write address setup time there you go it's actually zero nanoseconds so there is no address requirement so your data has to doesn't have to be there so you've got well uh, let's say that your clock rate was uh, 20 megahertz for example you've got a whole 50 nanoseconds to get all of your address signals over there before you clock in uh, that ad address because there's zero setup time required but depending on how your computer works your processor your processor architecture or your FPGA or whatever it is that you're reading the data okay you can you request your data for example it comes out of the chip but it might be latched into the processor on one of the half cycles for example opposite clock edge to what you use to get it out of the chip so you might only have your 25 nanoseconds to get your data across and then there might be set up 
uptime on that particular uh, data and things like that. So yeah, you might have to go into that sort of detail. And when you're talking about a TTL computer like this, where the process is actually made up of all these chips, each individual chip, the register in your chip will have its own propagation delay time. And uh, as I said, trying to analyze something like that, is just nuts. That's why you wouldn't bother. You'd go mentally insane. You'd have to call the white van and take your way because you just, you build it up and you see if it works and then you adjust your clock up and oh, look, it works up to 10 megahertz. Beauty, but it doesn't work at 11. Meh, whatever. Like if you went in, if you're sane enough, you could go in and look at, let's go down, have a look at the propagation delays. Here they are, you just scroll down until you see the nanoseconds, 12 nanoseconds, that's typical, but that's gonna vary with voltage, with temperature, with all sorts of stuff. So there you go, I like, you know, right there, you combine that with all the other dozens and dozens and dozens of chips on here. But uh, as I said, you could use a faster logic, 74F for example, it's gonna have a faster propagation delay time than this. So yeah, you might be able to eke out a more speed more speed from your design by doing that. But generally, yeah, you're gonna be constrained in these TTL type designs drastically. All right, let's take a quick look at DDR memory. As I said, on this uh, Xilinx, uh, processor board that which uses DDR3 memory. Now this won't be a DDR3 tutorial because no, that's a one hour video in its own right. Um, this We'll just have a quick look at the data sheet used. So here's our termination resistors over here, 40.2 ohms. They go to a specific uh, midpoint uh, termination voltage and I won't go into the reasons why. It's a complex issue if you really want to get into uh, termination of DDR memory and all that sort of jazz. Anyway, you don't pull them high, you don't pull them low, it's it's a to a voltage series voltage source. Anyway, um, yeah, this is the memory chip that we're using DDR3. So let's, here we go, it's a micron jobby and it's, you know, it, it's pretty new tech. Let's, let's take a look at this thing. These are our cycle times down here. Look at this, 938 picoseconds. We're talking puffs here. Now this nanosecond rubbish, right, for the DDR3 2133. Not sure what value we have on this design, but we're down into the one nanosecond class timing here, right? Then this is just cycle, let alone uh, propagation delay and skew between signals. You'll hear me start talking more about skew rather than uh, propagation delay at this point. Because what we start talking about now is a difference between one signal and another. So the skew between the signals. You want everything to be clocked all at the same time. You want all, if you send out an address from your processor to your memory chip, you want them all, all the pins to arrive there at the same time. That's why you want a length match. And when you're down in cycle times, like one nanosecond, it's really gonna matter. And these data sheets have 200 plus pages for a reason. <laughs> I can't possibly go into all the details of driving DDR memory. I think just the state diagram's enough to scare you away. Well, as always with these videos, I didn't actually plan before I went ahead with this. I just press record and, and, and see what happens. And I started going through the data sheet and I'm just like, my eyes are rolling. How do I increase the signal to noise uh, ratio here and pull out the important stuff? So I went, oh no, look, bugger it. Micron have probably got an app note. <laughs> <laughs> that that will make it a bit easy, a little bit easier for us anyway. And sure enough, they do. I'll link it in down below. Point to point simulation process. And this talks about your timing budget, which is a big thing that you'll hear in these types of uh, designs when you're, like you wouldn't always do this. If you're laying out this board here, right? Uh, like you wouldn't, I would not go in and do a timing budget for, for something like this. I, I just really wouldn't like waste my time doing, sometimes it's not a waste of time, but I really wouldn't bother. All I would know is that, right, let's just match the lengths of the traces and that's it. And and just be done with it, right? You don't have to worry about stuff like, like how, how close do I need to match? Just match them to within, I don't know, in like half a bee's dick, you know, five millimeters or something like that. Set some constraint in there, match all of the lines to the DDR together. And then, and then you don't have to worry about doing the sorts of stuff which we're about to take a look at here, looking at analyzing 
Error budgets. There's a clock source, there's a transmitter, which might be your processor slash FPGA. For example, there's data and strobe lines, and there's receiver, and these all have skew or propagation delay. Just think of skew and propagation delay, is the, they're effectively the same thing. The, you've got the transmitter skew here, you've got the PCB skew, which is the thing we're interested in, and the receiver skew as well like the internal setup and hold propagation delay times inside the chip and the transmitter as well when it's sending uh, data back. So then they talk about the signal integrity process. As I said, we won't talk about signal integrity, but it does impact these things. So anyway, in this particular case, they've got a 266 megahertz period, which is a 3.75 nanosecond half period because it's, it's DDR, double data rate. So we've got a setup budget of 1.8 Nano 1.875 nanoseconds because we're working 1800 picoseconds. We're now down in the picosecond region here, right? This is this is real engineering. And then we've got our hold budget of 1875. And then they've they've pulled out the transmitter skew. Well, they tell you where they get it from, the vendor data sheet here, and they then they tell you that what budget do we have left over? We have 585 picoseconds for our PCB SKU. So that's the longest period uh, that we can afford, the biggest mismatch we can afford to have between the traces on our PCB. And it it'll, might tell you which uh, traces we go down into, but basically setup and hold times are exactly the same. So right off the bat, we get our confuser here. And so 150 millimeters, none of that inches rubbish, 150 millimeters uh, times point 585 because it's a nano per nanosecond so we're talking uh, 87 millimeters 87 millimeters difference that we can have maximum difference between uh, let's just say all of our traces for our chip we don't know exactly which ones yet but you know let's just keep it simple so there you go up to 85 that that 87 that sounds like a lot and we won't mention voltage margin and stuff like that. Let's just let's just not go there. This is an interesting uh, diagram. It shows the skew and how the the data is only valid with inside here. If your skew, let's say your skew was this big here, then it would start impacting. In, it is squeeze in the the eye narrows. It's called the eye, and it narrows and narrows and narrows until. Well, your operating uh, valid window for your data is NAFL and then your system just completely falls over. And the reason we don't go into uh, signal integrity is because, well, yeah, just gets a bit complicated, doesn't it? But, aha, uh -huh, the board skew budget we have to actually break that down even further. It gets more complicated. The components that make up the board skew budget include ISI, VREF noise, path length mismatch, which is uh, uh, the main thing that we're talking about, crosstalk, uh, input capacitance mismatch, termination resistor, tolerance, the type of termination, where the termination resistors are, nuts. So we can look at the different uh, components here and they break them down, which is really good. First of all, we've got the ISI, which is uh, inter-symbol interference. What that basically means is a symbol is, is what's inside the eye here, right? The, the, the type of data that you've got in there. And due to reflections on your PCB, you might have one data interfering, uh, the previous data interfering with the new data because then you've got some overshoot, undershoot, some reflections coming back and that can interfere sometimes, sometimes not. It doesn't always happen because your data is always changing. So some symbols, some combination of data may interfere with another combination of data if they're in the right order, depend on termination. So uh, it, like it's, it, it's to do with the data that you're actually transferring, not just the fact that you've got your termination right. Anyway, inter symbol interference, and and that's what it tells you. It can cause by the bus running faster than it can settle, basically, um, because you need time for it to settle before you send the next data, so that your data doesn't interfere with from the previous data due to signal integrity issues. So anyway, that is a component of that. And then you've got crosstalk between your signals because your signals are right next to each other, and they're they're talking and they're coupling, and if you're routing them. They're typically running parallel like that. And when you have traces running parallel like that with no ground shield in between them, you get capacitive coupling. If traces just cross like that, the cross talks very little because there's little mutual uh, capacitance between them. But when you're running buses, 
like this all the way up, then the crosstalk can be very serious. And we won't go into differential mode, common mode, and we get into signal integrity, come on. And coupled circuits is all just part of that. We won't talk about crosstalk effects, blah, blah, blah. Uh, V-ref noise, that's a thing. As I said, the termination, the volt is terminated to a mid rail voltage reference. You can actually get specific voltage reference DDR termination chips that are actually designed to do this. And the noise of these reference voltages impacts your budget, for your timing budget for the amount of skew that you can have on your PCB, the difference in your traces. So for example, with a 0.5 volt per second edge rate and a 50 millivolt VREF noise, it's, it's 200 picoseconds of strobe to data skew. And there you go, it's extremely important aspect of DDR uh, and SD RAM design when laying out the trace should be as wide as possible to reduce inductance on the line. So really here's where <laughs> signal integrity does matter just on getting your voltage reference. And I've uh, done DDR designs where I've decoupled and inductor isolated the VREF to buggery because it, 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 it matters. And then they tell you about the space into adjacent signals from the VREF because you typically want to keep your VREF isolated from crosstalk from other signals as well. So not only crosstalk between signals, but crosstalk between your signals and your voltage reference for your termination resistors. And this has a large impact on your total timing budget. Now here we were just going to talk about uh, like propagation delay of traces. No, it's more than that. Then you've got input capacitance variation. Look at your data sheet. We could go in and see what our input capacitance variation is. Should we do that? Oh yeah, why not? Look at all this. ODT sensitivity definition to do with the IO calibration. Oh. Ha! I found it. You search for capacitance and Bob's your uncle. Look at this. Input output capacitance. Ta-da! But look at this. The variation 1.4 to 2.5. That can ruin someone's day. And someone could be you. And would you like single-ended or differential fries with that, sir? So anyway, yeah, that could matter. <laughs> Let's get down here. Here we go. Here's our timing budget, okay? So this is, you remember this was the transmitter skew, the receiver skew, and all of this stuff down here is the stuff that's made up is our budget for our total PCB skew, basically. But if you have a look here, the path length mismatch that's all we got. That's all we got. Calculation from spec. When you subtract all the other stuff from the total, what was it? The 580 or whatever picoseconds that we had. When you take out cross torque and, and inter symbol interference and VREF noise, it, it doesn't leave you much budget. 30 picoseconds. So, yeah. What's that? Get the confuser out again. So, average PCB at, you know, our rule of thumb, 150. Uh, millimeters uh, times 0 0.05, 50 picoseconds. We're talking 7.5 millimeters. There you go. So 7.5 millimeters, just, just off the bat there, is kind of like the worst case we could get if we were using the, laying out this board with this chip. And that would include the, the, you know, the PCB weave uh, problems, variation in the dielectric constant of the PCB material, stuff like that, right? We're not including any of that. So right off the bat there, seven and a half. So good design prudence would say you would at least halve that to be on the safe side. So, you know, as I said, like you'd be down in the millimeters before I kind of guessed, you know, oh, I said it less than like five millimeters difference. There you go, that's why. Um, because, right, so you'd say, oh, like a couple of millimeters difference, for example, because when, when you're laying out this kind of PCB, you can do it. I've done it without the uh, the tools to automatically uh, drag and do the, you know, when you drag your EV differential pair or your single uh, pair to match the lengths. I've done it without the automated tools to do that. But when you have a PCB tool, and I believe KiCad, although I haven't actually used it, I believe KiCad actually does have route. Here it is, tune track length, tune uh, differential pair length and things like that. I haven't used it. Anyway, we can somehow tune that and we can set the parameters and things like that. I haven't used this in KiCad, um, so please forgive me. But anyway, when you've got an automated tool to do it, you may as well set 
fairly precise constraints. You know, there's no reason why it can't be within a millimeter or two, something like that. So you wouldn't go, oh, I've got seven and a half millimeters to play with because I calculated my timing budget. I'm a hero and I spent a whole week working on my timing budget. No, just, <laughs> just lay out your board so that you've got no skew between your signals. They're matched to within a millimeter or two. So anyway, that is why you see all of these little zigzaggy serpentine traces like this on boards is because they're trying to match the lengths in this case, which is, what's this signal? There you go. Yeah, this is DDR. So this is actually a differential pair. Okay, so this is a, a the positive and negative. You can see it, the DQS3 negative and positive. So they're actually, so this is why you're keeping the pairs going like that and ah, this one is a good example it just happens to be a good example because look not only do you have to match the length of this pair here to uh, data pair four and five and six and seven you match those lengths between the pairs you also match the difference this is why it's got an extra little kink in here look at this little kink going out here like this and the other one doesn't have it because you're matching the difference between uh, D3 positive and negative so you match the length there and your tool your automated tool can actually do this and, and you can do it manually I've done lots of boards where I've had to manually add in the squiggles and, and it's, it's a lot more work so why these uh, tools are valuable in a PCB when you're laying out DDR uh, memory is you know <laughs> it can save you a lot of time it can do the push and shove and it does you just set it up you know I want this maximum difference between your pairs like this so it'll add in these little kinks there's another little kink out here as well you can see that and and then it'll also match those between the pairs as well when you when you're manually laying them out or if you're auto routing but don't auto route manually route anyway that's why you have these two different types of serpentine traces like this both within a differential pair and between differential pairs or between uh, single-ended traces like D0 and to D7 and A0 to A7 or whatever it is on your memory. So that's it. There you go. So um, yeah, this video is long enough. Sorry, but that's basically what it comes down to is timing budgets and timing budgets are critical. But as I said, you don't have to go in and do a timing budget. You're laying out a board with your DDR memory or whatever, you know it's critical <laughs> because I've told you so, everyone's told you so, Micron's told you so, every Tom, Dick and Harry's told you so, and you can go in and analyze it yourself, but you don't have to. If I was laying out this board, as I said, I would just set those constraints to a millimeter or something like that, something reasonable. Don't set it to like 0.01 millimeters, half a bee's dick, because the software is just going to go, can't do it, sorry. Um, yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> don't gild the lily there. But that's all you have to do. Just do that. Know it's critical. Put it in. And then you've got other signal integrity things to worry about. In fact, it might tell you that. Yeah, it does. There you go. They talk about split uh, return paths a bit here. So if you've got your never split your ground planes, if you add a little cutout in your ground plane like that, not a physical cutout, a routed out part of your board, but if you, <laughs> for some reason, didn't flood fill your ground under there and it's got to take a longer path, oh, you've just ruined your day right there again. You've ruined your timing budget, you've ruined your signal integrity, you ruined everything. And well, yeah, they're going to sack your ass because you didn't know how to lay out boards. So there you go. I hope you liked that video. You can't, as I said, you can do video, whole video series of just on signal integrity, just on uh, doing, analyzing DDR timing budgets and, and things like that. <laughs> anyway, I hope you learned something from the video. And if you did, please give it a big thumbs up. And if you want to see more videos of, you know, more specific stuff like this, then uh, please let me know. And occasionally I see a tweet like that and it just goes, oh yeah, I'll, I'll do a video on that. I'll just press record and have a rant for half an hour. Anyway. Hope you liked it. As always, discuss down below in the comments or over on the EEV blog forum. Catch you next time.